This story goes all the way back to July 13th, 2004, just outside of Newberry, South Carolina. A Bell 407 with a flight paramedic, a flight nurse, and a patient that had just been picked up from a major highway accident fly straight into the side of a mountain. How could this have happened? Were there factors at play besides what was in the final report? That and more coming up on this episode of The Dr. Medic. Before we get into this story, I want to go over a very important background piece. Typically, in the United States, helicopter EMS crews are made up of three people. A pilot, a flight paramedic, and a flight nurse. Yes, I know there are some places where there may be two nurses or two paramedics or maybe a respiratory therapist instead of a paramedic, but still, 95% of the flight crews in the United States are pilot, paramedic, and nurse. Many years ago, before accreditation of a helicopter EMS, otherwise known as HEMS, was a big thing, and before crew resource management was really ever even discussed in HEMS, the medical crew were not really considered part of the crew. As I discussed in a previous accident investigation, the medical crew back then were really called medical attendants and were really not involved with as many decisions as they are today. Not too long before this accident, the nurse and the paramedics started to become more of the crew and they were involved in more discussions about flights and weather and the famous phrase was coined, three to go and one to stay. Ever since, HEM services have preached that phrase, which means that it must take all three crew members to consent to take a flight, but it will only take one of them to turn the flight down due to weather or some other safety issue. The phrase sounds nice, and I'm positive that at many places that it probably carries a lot of meaning, but as we will see in this story, I'm not so sure that the phrase always has the meaning that it is intended to, or that it is truly embraced by everyone who says it. This helicopter was owned and operated by a transport service called Medtrans. This particular service was being branded under the local name of Regional One, but for the rest of this story, I'm just going to refer to them as Medtrans to keep things simple. The time was 04.52 in the morning, and the crew received a flight request for a motor vehicle collision, or MVC, nearly 42 miles away. A weather check was completed, and the flight was accepted at 04.55. The crew departed from their base at Spartanburg Regional Medical Center just seven minutes later, which is a pretty fast lift time given the time of day. They all load up in their beautiful Bell 407 helicopter and it takes them about 20 minutes to get to the scene, flying at roughly 130 knots. Once on scene, the pilot completed a single circular reconnaissance flight and then landed directly on the highway in front of a fire department engine. The helicopter was on the ground for no longer than 10 minutes as the medical crew retrieved the patient and loaded them into the aircraft. The helicopter then departed the scene and flew across the highway where it then climbed above the trees of the surrounding hills. The helicopter then appeared to be flying straight but then went straight into some fog where it then descended straight into the side of the mountain where it impacted the tops of 100 foot tall pine trees. The helicopter subsequently impacted the ground where a large post-impact fire consumed much of the aircraft. It took almost an hour for other emergency crews to locate the crash site. And tragically, the pilot, the flight paramedic, the flight nurse, and the patient all died in this accident. The aircraft was a Bell 407, which was manufactured just a few years earlier in 2001 and had a 650 horsepower Rolls-Royce 250 C47B engine. Its last inspection was just a few days before the crash on July 5th. The pilot's name was Bob, and Bob was hired by Medtrans in April of 2003. He had previously worked at Arivac Life Team. According to interviews, Bob left Arivac because he felt that the company, at the time anyway, was not safe and that he felt pressure to take flights even in unsafe conditions such as bad weather. Bob had a total of 2,133 total flight hours, all of which were in rotor wing. 
This seems like a pretty low number for EMS pilots as many places may require many more flight hours just to get hired. Of those 2,133 hours, just 104 of them were on type in the Bell 407. Bob had 48 hours of simulated instrument flight time with less than one of those hours coming in the Bell 407. There were actually no records of any actual flight with Bob in instrument conditions. Bob did have recurrent training about a year prior to the accident with only 11 minutes spent simulating instrument flight in the aircraft. He also had recurrent training on April 19th in 2004, again with only 30 minutes spent on instrument flight in a simulated environment. The other pilots, paramedics, nurses, and mechanics that worked with Bob, they all described him as being an extremely conservative and conscientious pilot. It was well known throughout the work family that Bob was oftentimes referred to as a weather chicken as he did not like to fly in bad weather or ever push the limit at all. The closest weather reporting station was located at Greenwood County Airport, which was about 24 miles away from their base. Now, remember that they accepted this flight at 0455, and the report from this weather station came in at 0456 was that the winds were calm, visibility was 5 miles with mist, clear skies below 12,000 feet, a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius, and a dew point of 21 degrees Celsius. An hour later, the same station was reporting 22 and 22 for temperature and dew point. This is a very important point in this story. The dew point is basically telling you the amount of moisture that is in the air. The higher the dew point, basically the higher amount of moisture is in the air at any given temperature. The definition of dew point is the temperature to which the air would need to be cooled in order to reach saturation. Well, what does saturation mean? It just simply means that the air is holding the maximum amount of water vapor possible for that given temperature. The air is most definitely saturated when the dew point and the temperature are equal, but the dew point can never be greater than the actual temperature. Therefore, if the air begins to cool, then moisture must begin leaving the air through a process called condensation. And it is this condensation that forms tiny little water droplets that eventually develop into fog, frost, clouds, or rain, and is why you see water drops and moisture on your car in the morning. In this case, given that it was early morning and the dew point and the temperature were basically equal, these would be prime conditions for ground fog to be forecasted in the area. One of the other pilots at the base said that he was extremely surprised to know that Bob even departed the base with a temperature dew point spread of zero, and he even reported that Bob had turned down previous missions with similar conditions. And in fact, following the crash of Medtrans, another Medtrans helicopter departed their base to search for the downed aircraft, and they had to turn around and return to their base because of heavy ground fog. The wreckage from this accident was located in a heavily wooded area within the Sumter National Forest just about a half mile from the original vehicle collision site. Most of the fuselage was consumed by a post-crash fire and the cockpit area received heavy fire damage. Well, at this point, you may be thinking that this pilot simply made a terrible decision and that he pushed the envelope by deciding to fly in such conditions. But this story has to go a bit deeper to determine why the accident actually happened. In previous videos, I have seen some comments from you guys that state, well, this was 100% pilot error and nothing else. Well, sort of, but when it comes to accidents, we can no longer say that it was just pilot air. This even applies to car crashes. In the world of paramedics, we used to say motor vehicle accident or MVA, but we don't say that anymore. Now we say motor vehicle collision or MVC. We do this because technically there is really no such thing as an accident. Something else always led up to the incident. In previous videos, I've talked about the Swiss cheese model where it takes a series of events to actually break down and lead to some type of incident or injury. Same thing goes for pilot air. The answer is always much deeper. This next part I'm going to drastically try to simplify. Aircraft can fly in several different official conditions. 
Visual Meteorological Conditions, otherwise known as VMC, is one, and Instrument Meteorological Conditions, otherwise known as IMC, is the other. To fly in VMC, a pilot would fly under Visual Flight Rules, or VFR. To fly in IMC, a pilot would fly under Instrument Flight Rules, or IFR. All pilots with a license are technically already rated to fly VFR as that's how they learned to fly in the first place. With VFR, you're basically flying in conditions where you can look out the window of the aircraft and actually see where you're going and see the horizon. A step above and beyond a basic pilot certificate would be an instrument rating. This means that the pilot can fly in IMC conditions and under IFR rules. In order to purposely fly in IMC conditions, not only does the pilot have to be IFR rated, but so does the aircraft. And there are plenty of videos on YouTube that are dedicated to explaining VFR and IFR, so I'll let you dig a little deeper on your own if you want. But the point is that pilots can fly VFR in VMC, or IFR in VMC, or IFR in IMC. But the most important part related to this story is when a pilot who is flying an aircraft that is not IFR rated, which means they cannot ever purposely fly into a condition where they cannot see out of the aircraft. They cannot purposely fly into fog or clouds or any condition where IMC exists unless they do it inadvertently. In this case, Pilots normally fly 99 or even 100% of the time in VFR conditions, but suddenly and inadvertently they might find themselves in IMC conditions. They were flying along and all of a sudden they found themselves in a cloud or in fog. This is called inadvertent IMC or double IMC. During check rides with instructors, pilots have to practice flying into instrument conditions and then follow whatever plan their operator has set forth. If the aircraft is an IFR aircraft, then they can quickly do things like turn on their autopilot or altitude hold or something and then climb to an altitude where no obstructions exist and then plan an exit with their GPS or something. But if the aircraft is not IFR rated, this becomes far more difficult. In these cases, the pilot would not have an autopilot and would have to manually fly the aircraft based on the instruments they see in front of them, up to some specified altitude, and then call air traffic control for vectors to find themselves a way out of the IMC conditions. In the United States, the overwhelming majority of EMS helicopters are not IFR rated. Yes, there are some amazing aircraft out there like the EC-135 and 45 and the Sikorsky S-76, the AW-139, and a couple others, but when it comes to the Bell 206, the Bell 407, the EC-130, and the A-STAR 350, all of which make up the vast majority of EMS helicopters in the United States, most of them are not IFR rated or have autopilot. What do these agencies do? Well, they should have a regimented training program to practice flying into double IMC conditions so that if that time ever comes, the pilot is more than comfortable enough to accomplish the task. But more on double IMC in a little bit. There are also a couple of historical items that I think seem to play a major role here as well. The first one is the MedTrans company itself and their history, and the second one is an unfortunate tactic that we call helicopter shopping. Let's talk about MedTrans first. The company of MedTrans was basically started by one guy who was a very successful businessman with successful private aviation companies. He eventually broke off his EMS helicopter portion of his company and formed MedTrans in 1995 where they first received their Part 135 certificate. Now, much of what I uncovered, it did kind of appear to show that this was a company that preached about safety and not pushing the envelope, but I did find several items that seemed a bit concerning. Every Part 135 certificate holder needs to have an FAA approved helicopter training manual. And in this case, while the manual did say that their pilots needed to be able to fly on instruments if they inadvertently found themselves in that position, it did not say anything else about any other requirements or instrument ratings such as training or recurrent training or ongoing education. The chief pilot for MedTrans did say that Every four months during their Part 135 checkride, that instrument work was done, and this included inadvertent IMC, 
basic instruments, and unusual attitudes. During these check rides, they would simulate double IMC by having the pilot put on foggles, then having them fly looking under the foggles. The check pilot would tell the pilot he was in the clouds and then have him climb and contact ATC. Foggles are special glasses that pilots can wear that will limit their field of vision so they can really only see the instruments of the aircraft and cannot accurately see out the windows and is a very common practice to simulate IMC conditions. Remember that Bob's training consisted of a total of 11 minutes of instrument training during his last check ride, but following this accident, the company stated that now, instrument training will now make up nearly half of their recurrent training and include nighttime instrument flight with at least one hour of instrument time and also double IMC conditions at night. In the end, Medtrans did not seem to have enough emphasis placed on instrument ratings nor putting enough time into initial and recurrent instrument training. At the time, the CEO of the company was not even aware that his own director of operations, who was also a helicopter pilot, did not hold an instrument rating and was actually told this during the NTSB interviews and appeared shocked to find out that this was the case. Night vision goggles were also recommended by Medtrans pilots and certainly could have played a role in avoiding this accident. But back in 2004, these were still a newer technology in the civilian world and Medtrans even stated that they didn't purchase them because they were afraid to spend the money or they were also angry about the FAA certification process for night vision goggles. These aircraft did also have radar altimeters which are used to measure the height of the helicopter above terrain immediately below the aircraft. While Medtrans pilots were trained, and they were trained to set their radar altimeters to four to 500 feet at night, the radar altimeter in this accident was found undamaged, but it was set to 300 feet. But the Medtrans pilots admitted at the time that they routinely turned off their radar altimeters because their warnings were too loud and scared some of the pilots, with one pilot even stating, well, when I'm on final, I don't want a false emergency warning. So even though the radar altimeter could have helped in this situation, the pilots were routinely turning them off. The pilots also recommended terrain awareness warning systems, otherwise known as TAWS, to their executives who flat out said that they do not think that TAWS will help them. And at the time, this service was also not accredited by CAMES, with executives of the company saying that CAMES accreditation was just something that you would pay $50,000 for to get a plaque on the wall and that it would not change anything at their organization. So, at the time of this accident, new hire pilots at Medtrans did not have to have instrument ratings. They had very low requirements for total flight hours to get hired. They did not spend hardly any time training on instruments. They wouldn't pay for night vision goggles. They wouldn't pursue CAMES accreditation. And they paid their pilots about $45,000 per year. On to the second big issue, which we call helicopter shopping. Helicopter shopping is an unofficial term that we use in the HEMS industry that basically means that someone is calling around and asking for a helicopter to come pick up their patient. That someone could be a nurse, a doctor in a hospital, it could be an EMT, a fireman, a paramedic, or a cop on the ground at an emergency scene, or it could even be a dispatcher. When people are helicopter shopping, they're pretty much just disregarding the reasons why one helicopter cannot take the flight and just move on to the next one, and they'll do anything just to get somebody to accept the flight. This used to be far more prevalent than it is today, but it definitely still occurs. In the United States, most medical helicopters are for-profit companies, and turning down even a single flight can cost them tens of thousands of dollars. Over time, most HEM services have learned that it is far cheaper and far safer to err on the side of caution instead of losing a flight and risking it all and having a fatal crash. So how did helicopter shopping happen on the day of this accident? Well, at 0440 in the morning, Newberry 911 Center requested another flight service called Care Force to respond to the scene. They accepted the flight, but just two minutes into their flight, they returned to their own base due to heavy fog in the area. At 0448, Newberry 911 then called Medtrans Dispatch for their closest helicopter, which was Medtrans 1, who was already showing themselves as red. 
In hems, it is important and common to display your base as either red, yellow, or green. If you are green, then your base will not turn down any flights for weather and you can be dispatched to anything. If you are yellow, it means that no matter what happens, there will be a short delay while the pilot checks weather before accepting or declining the flight. And if it is in the red, it means that the weather is impossible to fly in and your base will not even be dispatched to a call, even to check for weather. So, in this case, the closest Medtrans helicopter was in the red status, so the Medtrans dispatcher told the Newberry 911 dispatcher that they would have to decline the flight. Just 60 seconds later, at 0449, Newberry 911 then calls Life Reach One, which is another helicopter service and is located in Columbia, South Carolina. Yes, we now have three services called for this flight. The Life Reach pilot initially accepted the flight but then changed his mind and declined the flight once he was told that the Care Force flight had returned to their base due to fog. After 10 minutes of shopping around and not finding anyone, Newberry 911 then decides to call the Spartanburg County 911 service and ask them if they have any helicopters in their area. The Spartanburg dispatcher then tells the Newberry dispatcher that they do have a helicopter, but they are in the yellow and will have to call them to check. During this conversation, the Newberry dispatcher does tell the Spartanburg dispatcher that the other services have turned down the flight due to weather. However, for some unknown reason, this information was never conveyed to the fourth and final helicopter that was dispatched, which is the Med Trans Accident Helicopter. While the Newberry dispatcher was on the line with the Spartanburg County dispatcher, you could even hear them say, I got a bad feeling that they're not going to be able to fly because Greenville couldn't. But we just need to know if we need to try to go ahead and try to transport by ground or what. And when you read through these transcripts, it all looks very frantic and disorganized as they spent nearly 20 minutes searching for a helicopter to accept the mission. And while Newberry did tell the Spartanburg County 911 about the previous missions, this was never told to the accident pilot. Based on what the other pilots at Medtrans had previously said about the accident pilot Bob, I would imagine there'd be no way that Bob would have accepted this flight if he had known that the other services and pilots had turned down the flight. In many systems across the U.S., we now have some systems in place that alert the crews, even if they work at different flight services, whether or not another base or pilot had turned down the same flight prior to making a decision. This is not mandated everywhere, but at least there has been a bit of progress on this over the years. Investigators published the probable cause for this accident as the pilot's failure to maintain terrain clearance as a result of fog conditions. A contributing factor was inadequate weather and dispatch information relayed to the pilot. But if we recall, during the interviews with the executives, the pilots and even the med crew all stated in one way or another that they never felt pressure to fly in bad weather. That they always felt comfortable turning down a flight for bad weather without the fear of repercussions or retaliation. If that was the case, then why, of all the pilots in the world, would the one pilot who is called a weather chicken accept a flight in such terrible weather conditions? Well, we already know that one of the main reasons was because he did not know that the flight had been turned down several times already. But there is more to it. In HEMS, there is not just a need to safely get to the patient, but you also have to safely get them to the hospital, and then your crew has to safely get back to base. When I was a flight paramedic, I worked at one flight service who clearly told me that all that matters is safely getting to the patient. If the weather turns to crap, you can always maintain patient care via the ground ambulance and then transport them by ground. But I also worked at another service who said that if they cannot predict good weather for the entire round trip, including getting back to the base, then they will decline the entire flight. The second one was clearly safer. The first one, with the policy of just getting to the patient, was a terrible policy. Just think, you're flying a helicopter in the middle of nowhere and have to land and pick up a patient, but now the weather has gotten worse. You are now faced with the decision of leaving your helicopter where it sits, which could be a street, a highway, or in the middle of a cow pasture, and then accompany a ground crew for possibly three or four hours or maybe even longer with a very sick patient, or risk taking off in bad weather.
I wonder what Pilot Bob felt as he was sitting there on the interstate and reviewing the weather while the medical crew was retrieving the patient from the ground EMS crew. Well, in a post-accident interview, the CEO of MedTrans, Dennis Rolfs, told his staff that if Pilot Bob had been successful in completing the mission, that he would have been fired. Following this accident, MedTrans began to implement portions of crew resource management into their initial and continuing education for all flight crews. Crew resource management is also a requirement for CAMES accreditation. One of the components in crew resource management is what we call a just culture. A just culture has a safety culture and most importantly, a positive reporting culture. And in a positive reporting culture, employees are able to report mistakes that they or others have made without the risk or fear of retaliation. If the mistake was a learning opportunity, then maybe some remediation would be necessary and then everyone can learn from it and move on. Or if someone does something reckless or on purpose, then maybe they will be disciplined or fired. But in this case, Pilot Bob did not have all of the information when he first accepted the flight. And it is possible that while he was on the highway waiting for the patient to be loaded, that he or even the flight paramedic or flight nurse started to have second thoughts about taking off in the fog. If so, it's also possible that maybe they felt the sentiment from the CEO that they would be fired if they made the safety decision to leave the aircraft there and abort the rest of the mission. And I have to admit, I mean, I cannot say this is for sure the case, but it's certainly a possibility. And I feel that this is the right spot to also mention that MedTrans had a similar crash to this one just two and a half months prior to this accident, where another Bell 407 crashed and killed the pilot, the flight paramedic, a three-month-old infant, and his mother, with the flight nurse suffering critical injuries but ultimately surviving. What was the probable cause of that accident? The pilot's inadvertent encounter with adverse weather, which resulted in the pilot failing to maintain terrain clearance. Contributing factors were the dark night conditions, the pilot's inadequate pre-flight preparation and planning, and the pressure to complete the mission. When the same types of accidents start to repeat themselves, we must look deeper into the culture and systems of the operator. So why did this helicopter crash? You had a pilot who was very new to HEMS. He had very little experience flying on instruments. He had very little training on instruments from MedTrans. The operator chose to not invest in night vision goggles. The operator chose to not seek out accreditation. The operator did not seem to pay their pilots a comparable salary to other flight services. There was no investment in terrain awareness warning systems. There was not a strict policy on the consistent use and implementation of radar altimeters. They had a disorganized process for dispatching and requesting helicopters. Crew resource management was not implemented. And you possibly had a culture where a newer and inexperienced pilot, or maybe even the paramedic and nurse, did not feel comfortable speaking up about declining the flight even after they showed up on scene. One thing to keep in mind here, even though it sounds like this video may be an awful lot wrong with the company of MedTrans, there's a lot wrong with a lot of companies. A reminder that this channel is not here to uh, pick apart some agency or make somebody look bad or make an agency look bad. It's to learn from these previous mistakes and see what we can do to move forward and do better. It's worth noting that over the last 18 years since this accident uh, took place, lots have changed at MedTrans. MedTrans does still exist. They were acquired by Air Medical Group Holdings in 2006, which is a big investment firm that bought up lots of other helicopter EMS services like AeriVac Life Team. With Air Medical Group Holdings then merging with AMR back in 2018 to make one giant company that we now call Global Medical Response, where Global Medical Response basically owns and operates the largest ambulance company in the United States with AMR and also one of the largest air medical provider groups with Air Medical Group Holdings. In that time, like I said, lots of things have changed. The radar altimeters, much more strict policies, HTAWs and TAWs are now required on all of these aircraft. Most, if not all, of MedTrans bases across the United States are now CAMES accredited, which means crew resource management training, at least at a minimum level, is implemented at least with all onboard training 
uh, which would include some level of just culture and safety culture and a reporting culture. Is it all perfect? No, probably not, but at least it's better than it was back then. And one last thing, we no longer call these emergencies missions, or at least most places no longer do this. This is not the military. This is civilian EMS in the United States. The safety of the provider and the crew always come first. Calling it a mission sends the message that it must be completed at all cost, which simply is not the case. They are just calls or emergency calls for service or requests for service. Either way, I hope that you learned something from this story. I know that I did. Please, please implement crew resource management. Embrace a just culture. Be safe and take care of yourselves. I do hope that everyone has a beautiful rest of your day and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank <laughs> you.